I think it's pretty reasonable to assume that at some point, some point perhaps in the middle of the century, China will be 15 to 20 percent of the world. And I think that's a very, very positive story. The issue now is, how does China keep this up? It is both the world's second largest economy, but it's also one of the poorest. If we're talking about IMF role in the world, China is a very successful example. China has grown at about nine and a half percent on average every year for 30 years. And that implies that the Chinese economy doubles in size about every eight years, which is why China has gone from being one of the poorest countries in the world when it started its reforms 30 years ago in 1979 to the second biggest economy in the world today. I joined the People's Bank of China in early 1990s. So we were at the early stages of a transition from a centrally planned economy to a market-oriented one. So how to do that? That was an enormous challenge. We found out that uh, the fund had a, a pool of uh, experience. The IMF and China have had a very close and positive engagement for many, many years. We actually have staff posted in China, and we've had that for the last 20 years. The advice that the IMF has given China is based on what we see happening in other countries that have faced similar situations. China has done a lot of reform successfully. And I think in this process, IMF played a very constructive, positive role. Probably the main benefit of this rapid Chinese growth is that the poverty rate in China has fallen dramatically. In the early 1980s, the rate was about 53% of the population lived in abject poverty. Today, that rate is 8%. Now, given the size of the Chinese population, 1.3 billion people, um, that implies that an estimated 400 million people have been lifted out of poverty. The striking thing about the Chinese model at the moment is how very state-led it is. And that's been particularly true in its response to the crisis. It produced a fiscal stimulus of a sort that the world has rarely seen. It also produced a financial and monetary stimulus that was remarkable. We have supported the response because we think that the government stimulus was very helpful. It came at the right time and it helped to cushion the economy from the worst of the downturn. China saw that exports were collapsing and the Chinese government needed to step in and to support uh, economic output, and they did that through spending on roads and infrastructure and on health, which helped them achieve the target growth rate. Many of our clients benefited from these stimulus policies, and we benefited from them as well. Therefore, Yanshan's performance has shown a stable and persistent growth in recent years. The biggest challenge for China is how do you reduce its uh, dependency on foreign demand for Chinese goods. As it is, Chinese demand is way too low. Uh, household consumption in China may well be the lowest ever recorded for any country. My impression is that the Chinese authorities recognize very well the need to rebalance growth away from a heavy reliance on exports and more towards domestic demand, particularly household consumption. It will be important to further develop financial markets and a stronger currency would help. The exchange rate is an important part of a package of reforms that will help to re rebalance the economy. Basically, we focus on encouraging consumption and encouraging the development of a service industry 
if you spend a lot of money on uh, social security, on uh, retirement program, rural medical program, and so on and so forth, you'll see that the result is the domestic consumption, retail sale, and also domestic demand increase. One of the reasons why Chinese consume so little is because they're very worried about the lack of pensions that they have, the lack of health insurance that they have, they're worried about the amount of money they have to spend on their children's education. We are happy if we are healthy. When we get ill, we need money to go to hospital. Therefore, we save up some money every month. When I was young, I didn't have enough to save up, and the idea of saving didn't occur to me. I didn't even know what to save for. I lived through the plant economy during my childhood, and life was hard then. But there was little pressure, as all of us were in the same situation. That is to say, the division between the rich and the poor was very little. Income inequality in China has gone from being uh, very flat two or three decades ago to being really rather extreme. And it's particularly striking given that this was a country three or four decades ago where there was an, almost no income inequality. I think China is a developing country and uh, continue to be a developing country for a long time. We have to have a scientific view of uh, development and we try to make our growth more sustainable and balanced. China is very concerned that it can't achieve an upper-middle-income country status. It's worried that its growth will falter, it won't be able to lift the rest of its 100 million people who live in poverty out of poverty. It has all the concerns that you would expect from a developing country. The efforts that the government has taken over the last year or two to broaden and deepen the pension system, to improve the public health system, these are very much steps in the right direction and we've supported them. But there are lots of other very difficult things that need to be done. One of the most obvious ones is to the whole situation with migrant workers. In 2009, when I came to Shenzhen, I earned 900 yuan as basic salary. Now the basic salary is 1,100, but we need to pay 300 or sometimes 240 for food. So the raise is nothing. Although many companies are recruiting, many people are looking for jobs as well. The competition is fierce. I don't think the pay is good. The accommodation and food provided are not good either, especially the accommodation. Usually they put several ragged beds in a tiny room. Beds that are provided by some factories are flea bags. First of all, as China has become more and more urbanized, the policies that dealing with urban and rural divide have to be in such a way that integration of rural population are fairer, are equal, so that those populations can better participate in the city. China could become a sort of consumer market that became one of the driving forces for the global economy. But this issue of migrant workers and the way they're prevented from really settling in cities is one of the main obstacles that's holding that back. Chinese consume way too little. Where people are mistaken is in thinking that consumption is a discrete problem that can be solved independently of a major reform of the growth model. That means improving equality on productivity instead of relying on cheap labor, on innovation instead of just exporting uh, lots of goods to the world economy. And all these things require uh, a much more defined and transparent set of formal institutions to give investors and households confidence to invest, to innovate, to spend, to consume. I think the challenge that we are facing, one is China's GDP is getting larger and larger, and the, the constraint 
to us is become more uh, uh, binding, uh, especially the resources constraint, uh, the energy constraint, and also uh, you see the environmental constraint. The adjustment to other countries as a result of Chinese growth will cause some to fear China as a threat. There's a growing recognition of the spillovers of Chinese growth for other countries. The value of uh, the fund in, the, in this regard is to provide a forum for countries to discuss policy issues. I think that the fund has been one of the key international platforms through which the international community get better understanding of China and also through which uh, China gets a better understanding of uh, the outside world.